It's a storytelling time machine, able to transport us anywhere or any time. It's a machine that guides our gaze, it demands our attention, and it juxtaposes visuals and auditory elements, conscious and subconscious elements, visceral, emotional, and intellectual elements. And yet, it encapsulates this complexity into a communal experience that spreads our attention across a finite swath of time. That is what film is. And it's pretty damn great if you ask me. I mean, you know, growing up, I saw this shift, this, this recognition of film as a profound artistic endeavor. I, I personally experienced it. I mean, I had always heard about this artistic ultimate goal, right? Writing the great American novel. And, and I read about it, and, and, and when I read about the beats, and, and the brawlers, and the hippies, and the heretics, journalists, junkies, like, I'm talking Hemingway, Bukowski, Burroughs, Kesey, Kerouac, all of them. But my friends and I, ne we never really wanted to write the great American novel. No, in the 70s and 80s, we wanted to make the great American film. Coppola and Kubrick were the artistic aspirations of my time, not Kesey and Kerouac. So as I grew older, Spike Lee, Jane Campion, Quentin Tarantino, Steven Soderbergh, I mean, just to name a few. But it's really interesting, isn't it? This list, mostly white, mostly male, true. And also the assumption that a director is equivalent to a novel writer as if Steven Soderbergh or Jane Campion or Spike Lee or Francis Ford Coppola made the entire movie themselves. This perception of filmmaking comes in large part from the auteur theory, which was put forward by a man named Andrew Saris. Now, Andrew Saris wrote movie reviews for The Village Voice in New York City starting in the 1960s. I met Mr. Saris in the 1990s when I was studying film at Columbia University. He was one of my professors, alongside Milos Forman. And he believed that since the director controls the audio and the visual elements of the film, then she or he is the author of the film. This is based on ideas that stem from the French New Wave cinema of the 40s and 50s. Saris would always point to filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock, Stanley Kubrick, and Orson Welles to make his point. And many say that the auteur theory raised the idea of film to the level of an art. Art with a capital A. Now, others disagree with Saris, most notably Pauline Kael. She rebuked the auteur theory, explaining that the directors often relied heavily on screenwriters, actors, cinematographers, editors, and sound designers to craft a movie, and that each of those jobs require their own creative process and input. In fact, Kael and Saris butted heads for decades in New York publications. Many years later, David Morris Kippen also took sides against Saris and proposed the Schreiber theory, claiming that the screenwriter and not the director is most influential in the success or failure of a film. Now, this was in 2006, and it probably wouldn't surprise you to learn that Kippen was the former director of literature at the National Endowment for the Arts. So ask yourself, who is the driving creative force in your favorite set of movies? Is it the writer, or is it the director? Or is it the producer, the person who typically hires the screenwriter and the director, hopefully with a vision in mind? Or is it more like a symphony, a symphony of creative effort? For instance, just imagine this, Leonard Bernstein conducting the London Symphony Orchestra, playing music by Johann Sebastian Bach with Yo-Yo Ma as a featured soloist on cello. Who is the creative voice in that scenario? Bernstein? Ma? Bach? Or are you buying a ticket to see the London Symphony Orchestra? In the case of film, the answer is, at least according to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, all of the above. Today, the Academy honors 24 different categories, including Best Actor, Best Screenplay, Best Art Direction, Cinematography, Costume Design, director, film editing, original score, sound mixing, visual effects, and best picture, which is typically accepted by the producer of the film. So this is my challenge to you. Go watch your favorite movie 
and then try to decide who the driving creative force is. Then, if you think it's a single person, isolate them and go see more movies with them in it. Do you align yourself more with Kippen and the, Schrei the Schreiber theory, Saris and the auteur theory, or with Kale and the Academy? Regardless of who you think is the driving force of any given film, let's take some time to figure out what narrative filmmakers are trying to do. Or more simply put, what makes a great movie great? It's no easy task, right? I mean, if we could create a reliable how-to manual for making great films, well, we'd all be zillionaires, and we wouldn't have to worry about buying a movie ticket and ending up watching a dud. But we're not zillionaires. And we do frequently find ourselves watching bad films. But that doesn't stop people from trying. And I have to say, I think that some people have come close to defining what it is that creates a great film. Now, personally, I think they accidentally glossed over the real answer, but it's there. And it, it's been there for quite some time, hidden. And I want to spend the rest of this lecture trying to unravel it for you, and I want to see if you agree. This is not a film criticism class, but it's important to know the history of where these ideas come from. So I'm going to give you the micro-compact version. If you want more details, there are plenty of books that will explain the foundation from which I'm going to springboard. Okay. Around 350 BC, the Greek, Greek philosopher Aristotle writes his theory of drama. It's called Poetics. And then nearly 2,000 years later, in the mid-1800s, a German playwright named Gustav Freitag decides to take a stab at figuring out how dramatic stories work, and he comes up with this thing called the Freitag Pyramid. And then, more than 100 years after that, a guy named Sid Field takes a stab in the 1970s by applying different dramatic theories to film. And that's all well and good, and Field's theory may have joined Freitag's ideas on the library shelves, but the 1970s were an interesting time for movies. Hollywood had been making movies for a while by this point, and filmmakers didn't really need a handbook. I mean, they knew how to make movies. They, they didn't always know how to make good movies, but they certainly didn't need someone like Sid Field telling them what to do. And neither did the rest of the world. But somebody did. In the 1960s, it started to become possible to go to college to study film. And not only possible, but it became widespread. From New York City to California, all across the country, you could go to film school at the graduate or undergraduate level. And college curricula have classes. And classes need books. And Sid Field had a book. And as the 60s turned into the 70s, people started graduating from these programs. People like Francis Ford Coppola from UCLA, George Lucas from USC, and Martin Scorsese from NYU. And Field started folding their films into his books and his analyses. And oh, by the way, these movies, these filmmakers, they were making blockbusters. I mean, we're talking about The Godfather, one and two. Star Wars, Apocalypse Now, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, American Graffiti. And as the 70s turned into the 80s and Hollywood started opening up to a new funding source, a wave of MBAs started making their way from the East Coast to the West Coast. And you know what they wanted? They wanted a playbook. They wanted a how-to manual. And Sid Field had the one. And in the 80s and 90s, when these new film production companies started trying to replicate the successes of the 70s, they started to rely more and more on this formula called the three-act structure. And that's the foundation I need to lay out for you. Not because I think the three-act structure is the formula for making great movies. No, in fact, many great films don't follow the three-act structure. What I think is, I think that the three-act structure secretly contains the secret to making great films. Field found it, he just didn't know what he found. It's like he threw out the pearl so he could eat the oyster. So, in a clamshell, here's the three-act structure. Imagine a grid. X-axis, Y-axis. On the X-axis, you have time. Minute zero to however long your film is. Say it's two hours. And Field breaks up this time into three acts. Act one, act two, and act three. The y-axis is tension. It starts at minute zero on the x-axis with very little tension. 
and then the tension gradually rises through Act 1 and Act 2 through events that Field identifies as inciting incident, the turning point, what have you. And then the tension reaches its highest point in Act 3 with the climax of the film. And that's all well and good, but that's not what I want to talk about. That's the oyster. Let's get rid of the oyster. Let's strip it all away and get down to the bare essentials. Now, this idea comes from my wife. Her name is Petra, and she's brilliant, by the way. I mean, PhD in neuromuscular physiology. And a long time ago, she told me that she believes that the most profound answers often come from the simplest questions. The most profound answers often come from the simplest questions. I like that. I'm a simple guy. So let's strip this model down. Let's throw out the oyster, and what do you have? You've got the x-axis and the y-axis, time over tension. As the movie goes on, the tension must continue to rise until the end. Simple enough. So here's the question. Here's the simple question. What's tension? That's it. What is tension? Now, of course, the knee-jerk reaction is to say that tension is conflict. And yeah, it is. But not always. Every scene is not an argument. Not every story is about a fight or a murder. If you like Hitchcock, you might say that tension is suspense, and again, true. But not every film is a mystery or a thriller. 